Good evening and welcome to CNN Money Switzerland. I'm Olivia Chang. Let's take a look at all the top headlines. Now to start things off, we bring you some heartwarming news to finish the week. For all those long distance couples who were separated when borders with Germany and Austria closed, well, they're finally able to reunite again. This was made at the latest press conference from the Swiss government just this afternoon. Now it kicks in as of midnight and it will be based on self-declaration. Up until now, only married couples or those in registered partnerships, as well as those with children were permitted to cross the borders. But authorities have been receiving thousands of requests in recent days also regarding unmarried couples. At the moment though, there is still no relaxation of restrictions with partners in France and Italy. But plans are in place for Switzerland to fully reopen its borders with neighboring countries on June the 15th. Meanwhile, the Federal Council has also approved the creation of a task force to help young people in search of an apprenticeship. The coronavirus pandemic has severely impacted the economy and has also hit the number of vocational training programs available on offer for those looking to just start their careers. The government said it is making funds available for apprenticeship projects being put forward by companies and cantons, and it will finance 80% of the costs. Swiss luxury giant Richemont said profit for the year ending in March fell by two thirds. Richemont was already grappling with protests in Hong Kong and in France before being dealt with the coronavirus pandemic in the final quarter. The company now predicts up to 36 months of grave consequences from COVID-19 and has also cut its dividend. In the meantime, it has reopened 462 boutique stores in China, but the recovery is expected to take longer in Europe and the US. Now, the Kof Swiss Economic Institute is expecting a, quote, deep recession in Switzerland as the fallout from the coronavirus pandemic continues. In their latest forecast, they predict the GDP to drop by 5.5% in 2020. This is despite the loosening of lockdown restrictions with more heading back to work and also going shopping once more. The situation is expected to pick up in 2021 with GDP growth of 5.4%. Now, scientists have long theorized a new type of vaccine. Instead of injecting a disabled virus and spurring a response, just give the body the genetic code to do all the work by itself. It's called an RNA vaccine, and it's never been done before, perhaps until now. CNN's Nick Payton Walsh visits one of the labs leading the way. Everywhere, there's a race for a COVID vaccine, but here, in London Paddington, there's a race for a new type of vaccine altogether. Professor Robin Shattuck is leading a team at Imperial College who are using a new technique to get the human body to recognise the most dangerous part of the virus, the hook or spike on its outside, so the body can be ready if it ever sees the real thing. You're not even giving the body part of the virus, you're giving the body the plans for the most deadly part of the virus. Absolutely. They begin human trials in mid-June and hope for 6,000 human tests by October. Maybe early next year, this revolutionary technique will be ready for you or I. Here's how it works. The spikes on the surface of the virus are what allows it to uh, attack and get into the cells in your body. Their technique injects the genetic code of that spike into the body and lets your muscle cells make lots of the spikes and your immune system recognises that and starts to make antibodies that bind and recognise that spike so that when you see the whole virus having been immunised, your immune system immediately makes antibodies that lock onto the spike and means that the virus can no longer infect cells. It's a new technique entirely because most vaccines give a weakened entire virus for the body to learn to fight. The cells are working like a factory. They're making the vaccine themselves, doing the heavy lifting, rather than us having to make huge amounts of virus in a manufacturing plant. And this technique has two advantages. The amounts needed per dose are tiny. And so 16,000 litres could, in theory, they say, be enough to vaccinate the entire world. And two, the technique, if successful, can be used for other viruses too in the future. The huge steps coronavirus is forcing us to take, leading us into a new world of great, unexpected advances. 
Demand for art secured loans continues to rise after jumping during market turmoil earlier this year. My colleague Tanya Koenig caught up with the CEO of the fine art group Fraser Stewart to talk about art prices and where to store works as collateral. So I, art finance very simply is where an owner of art, frequently a collector or a gallery or a dealer, uses their art as collateral for a loan. So to give you an example, um, a collector that I'm working with at the moment has um, a Richter and a Pollock and their value, the, the value of those two paintings is about $20 million and we will lend $10 million against those two paintings for about two years. So it's, it's very straightforward, it's relatively short term, one or two years and we lend about 50% of the value of the artworks um, and we give the collectors uh, a loan against their art. So as you mentioned, this art secured lendings is one of your core services. Now you've seen a pickup in, in demand since uh, March this year. I was wondering who is uh, collateralizing art and, and why? We, we've definitely seen a, a real increase in the last few months. Um, driven you know partly by this mentality of uh what i would call cash is king um and some collectors are looking for additional cash because they think that it is or it will be a buyer's market so they want to buy more art so they're raising capital against their collection to buy more art we've also seen some collectors using their artwork as collateral to help them pay what, what are called margin loans, uh, margin calls on, on their loans. So this is where their investment portfolio has has decreased and the bank is requiring them to pay some, some cash collateral, basically. Yeah. Um, and we can provide cash really quickly. Um, the other kind of general um, bucket is collectors who just want to have that additional cash buffer in times of uncertainty, generally in, in most markets, people want to know that they've got access to cash if they need it, if they want it. Um, so there's definitely quite a lot of that at the moment. We, we've seen about a threefold increase in uh, real um, loan inquiries. And who exactly are your clients then? Do you also work with, with wealth managers? We do have um, a number of Swiss collectors as our clients. Um, we work with Swiss wealth managers, um, some of the private banks in Switzerland. Um, we're, we're an international business, but, but definitely, you know, there is, there's a lot of art in Switzerland, as everybody, um, you know, is familiar with. So there's, there's a lot of collectors, there's a lot of wealth managers in Switzerland. We also have um, a, an office in Switzerland, so we, we work out of Switzerland directly. Um, we, our, our client base is quite entrepreneurial. Um, there's a lot of entrepreneurs in our, in our collector base, and that's partly because the, the entrepreneurial mentality and in their business, they're very familiar with using um, credit facilities, um, leverage. Um, so it's, it's very familiar to them um, and using their art to release capital for other investment purposes makes complete sense to them you know it's a lot of money to have tied up in high value art you know some collectors have you know 100 million 200 million dollars um in their art collections and they can use some of that cash uh, more effectively if they take a loan out from it can you give me a specific example of of um, an artwork that has been recently uh, lended uh, or as a collateral we're doing a loan right now um the the collector is based in the States. Um, she was going to sell her property um, in LA, uh, sort of 15, 20 million dollar property. And because of the current circumstance, she's taken the property off the market and she would like some kind of bridge funding, interim capital. So we're lending against um, an Andreas Gursky, an Ed Ruscha, um, a Damien Hurst. So you know, that's that's an example of a loan we're working on right now. Um, 
to give a, a collector some additional capital to, to see them through um, the next year or so. The Swiss Federal Council and the IOC have both released major funding packages to aid sports organisations during this time. Ralph Stokely from Swiss Olympic discusses the next steps with our sports correspondent, Matt Layton. In the last uh, 48 hours, there's been money pouring in from all directions, from the, uh, the Swiss federal government, from the IOC. Um, is this enough money? And, and how will you decide what's going to be done with it? I think it's, 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 we're not able to say if it's enough or, or not. We really need to go into details. Therefore, we, we put this project in place. We're going to analyze the numbers, the forecasts uh, down to the club level. Uh, uh, we're talking about the almost 19,000 clubs uh, within uh, Switzerland that, that, that there are the foundation of, of this, the whole system. And we, we need to dig in deep to, to come up with the right numbers and the and right measures to put in place to be ready for the future. Are we talking about uh, money given or are we talking about loans? Is, do you have a strategy to, to, to work that forward? Not yet. Actually, the government decided to hand over loans to the professional leagues. We're talking yeah. about soccer and, and ice hockey and, uh, and uh, a faux perdu uh, in French. Uh, it's, yeah, yeah. it's like uh, real money for the help of the clubs and the national federations. But we need to come up with, uh, with, with the right system, the right criteria to make it really powerful. And just staying on sports, it's no secret that esports have been thriving during the coronavirus lockdown. Cedric Schlosser, co owner and CEO at MYI Entertainment, says public perception of digital games are changing and parents are also getting a slice of the action. Take a listen. Cedric, obviously, we've had two months now of shutdown of traditional sports. How is the esport market uh, doing at the moment? Well, esports in general is, of course, doing much better than normal sports. Um, we have to say that also esports now loves big uh, arenas with tens of thousands of people on site. So that part is gone. But the viewership of the esports tournaments have risen uh, exponentially through this time. Actually, we have had the new viewer records and there have been new formats also tried out with, with a record number of viewers. And that's the big advantage of esports. We can play it from home in theory. Yes, the production value will be down a little bit. It will be hurt by not seeing the players maybe in a perfect camera angle. But in the end, the consumer doesn't really care about it. He cares about the game, right? And he cares about the game play. And there we have seen that esports can stay alive during this crisis and is now doing great at the moment. Are you taking um, viewers from traditional sports? Are you getting new viewers? Or where's your viewership? What's your demographic? Well, in general, it's of course still the, the very young demographic between like 15 and 30 that is, our, is the core audience. Uh, that core audience is, is now bigger because they have less other things to do, I assume. Uh, the numbers there are still not all confirmed, but definitely also we can see that new numbers are coming in. In Switzerland, we've seen that, for example, just uh, this weekend, uh, Swisscom Hero League is a league called where they um, also broadcast in Swiss TV and, and they're Many people are now sitting at home that normally would not be watching and they now have probably come in contact for the first time with esports and actually our team played there and uh, we have seen now a lot of reactions actually by parents and by people who normally are not really in our space that have seen it and that are watching and, and so there is a potential for a new audience growth, definitely. Linear TV, is that just a short term um, possibility or once traditional sports come, come, uh, come back on, will you be kicked off again? I think we were there to stay in general. Yeah, I, I think the, the more the more the TV providers and, and the different content uh, producers see that esports can work and it's a format that is quite cheaply produced compared to a huge um, tournament that needs a lot of space and, and infrastructure. Here, of course, to make good production value, it's still kind of expensive, but it still doesn't need a stadium in most times. We can do studio productions that are as entertaining as many other formats in esports. And, and so there, there's a lot of advantages there. Uh, there can be very quick international competitions in the globalized world. There is a, so there's many advantages there that they can use to also the young audience likes late slots. So it's no problem to play something at 10 o'clock in the night. Uh, it's no problem to play something in the night on a weekend. Uh, it's also Sunday sports. You can play it easily on Sunday. So there's a lot of these small advantages that the cable providers will hopefully use for their benefit. Now. And it's not just players that are profiting. Investors have also done well out of video gaming and esports, with stocks in this sector increasing in value. But the European director of investment management firm Avanek believes the boost still hasn't created a bubble. 
Well, that's obviously a concern uh, that people uh, always look at. And um, yeah, we've also taken that into consideration. Uh, if, if you look at price earnings levels, um, yeah, I think esport companies, video gaming and esport companies are around 40 at this point, which is a little higher than the average uh, NASDAQ uh, number, if, if you will. Um, but I don't think that really indicates that there is a bubble going on at this point. Oh, that's what I was going to ask you. Do you think that this could lead them to a bubble? Um, at this point, no. I, I think, um, especially with uh, uh, with the interest of o over the last couple of weeks, yeah, we definitely saw a lot of inflows. There's definitely more people invested in, in these companies now, but it's certainly not uh, any cause for concern, and I don't expect it to become anything like that within the next six to 12 months. Okay, but bubble or not, once people start going back to work and back to school um, and, and there are other outside activities on offer to us, you know, watching esports, playing video games is going to go down. Well, I think for sure that uh, once people will full time go back to school and, and back to the office, um, yeah, definitely the usage uh, will go down a bit. Um, but that will be... I think in line with the expectations we already had uh, before COVID. Um, and I also think that from a structural perspective, uh, there will be an elevated level uh, going forward. There's uh, a number of companies that already have indicated that even if uh, the governmental restrictions are um, uh, somewhat lessened, um, a lot of people will still have the freedom to work from home. But they should be working from home and not gaming from home, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, for sure. But I, I think a lot of people like to take a break every now and then. I've definitely uh, seen my kids doing schoolwork from home, but taking a break every now and then. And instead of, uh, well, hanging around in, in the playground of school, they're now doing a quick game and then getting back to it. You can catch up, of course, on all of our latest content simply by heading over to cnnmoney.ch. That's all for you for now. But in the meantime, remember to take care, stay safe, and we will see you again very shortly. Good evening.